I'm Glenn Tiffert, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. And on behalf of myself and senior fellow Larry Diamond, with whom I co-chair Hoover's project on China's global sharp power, I'd like to welcome you to the second in a two-part series in which we hear from and learn from African voices about the issues that are on their minds in their country's increasingly complex relationships with China. In this series, we travel from one end of Africa to the other, from the island nation of Madagascar, or the island nation of Mauritius, east of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean to the Gulf of Guinea, off of Nigeria and Cameroon, and to points in between, namely Zambia and South Sudan. We talk about mass surveillance, infrastructure, corruption, environmental equity, and natural resource extraction. But most of all, we are going to be talking about how African people and nations can strike more equitable relationships with their external partners, particularly China, and how civil society plays a critical role in holding African elites and governments democratically accountable. This is a goal with which people everywhere can identify, and I extend my respect and admiration to our speakers who are guiding us in this series and for making a difference, not just in their own societies, but in sharing their knowledge so that others in Africa and beyond can pick up the baton and carry it further. One year ago, Larry Diamond and I began a months long series of seminars and dialogues that united experts on China from across the globe with nearly 30 journalists, academics and civil society leaders from 24 sub-Saharan African countries to share some of what we know, but more importantly, to learn from their firsthand experience. In this series, you are hearing a sample of some of the knowledge that they are giving back. All of their papers are downloadable from hoover.org slash CGSP for China's Global Sharp Power, and I encourage you to visit the site to read their papers. We will start today by hearing from Ms. Mary Goch about the environmental consequences of China's involvement in oil extraction in South Sudan. Ms. Goch works as the director of the Catholic Radio Network, a national organization of community-based radio stations in South Sudan and Sudan. She previously served as the chairperson of the Association for Media Development, a member-based association for independent media. And she was a journalist with The Citizen, a newspaper in South Sudan. Our second speaker, Agnes Ibo, is an international law expert from Cameroon who specializes in human rights, governance, and accountability in West and Central Africa. Her work currently focuses on the ocean's governance in relation to maritime security, the private sector, and civil society engagement. She will be speaking about distant water fishing and illegal unreported and unregulated fishing, which is a pressing global problem in the Gulf of Guinea. And finally, we are honored to have as our discussant today, the Honorable Jindai Frazier. Among her many distinctions, Dr. Frazier is currently Dignan Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, and former U.S. Ambassador to South Africa. So without further de delay, Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Glenn, for taking us through this course for one year. I'm glad that today we will be finalizing everything. To start on my presentation, the title of my article is China Explores South Sudan's Oil Sector Without Environmental Care. And I would like to talk a little bit about South Sudan for those who don't know South Sudan. The Republic of South Sudan is a landlocked country in East and Central Africa. The country gained independence in 2011 after South Sudanese voted overwhelmingly to separate from the Sudan. It was the world's youngest nation until December 24. 2021, when Barbados was declared a republic. So we are now second youngest country in the world. It has a population of approximately 12 million people. Sadly, once the independence was achieved, two years later, political wrangles started causing a bloody civil war, which recurred again in 2016. After that, a regional intervention led to the signing of peace agreement, first in 2015, but it collapsed. That's why there was another civil war in 2016. And later, 
revitalized peace agreement for the resolutions of conflict in South Sudan was negotiated. And that agreement was signed in September 2018, which formed the current transitional government of national unity. Since I'll be talking specifically about the oil sector, that was the brief history about South Sudan. In terms of the oil sector, oil production contributes over 90% of South Sudan's income, making it to be a prestigious commodity in the country. And since our independence, it is only oil that has been contributing majorly to the income of the country. Other resources might be there, but they are yet to be explored. China specifically is mentioned in my article, and actually most of the areas I covered is about China because China is the greatest oil success uproot has been in Sudan. So because of that, South Sudan is the source of oil production because the oil is based in South Sudan all along. So the success of oil uh, production for China is because of the South Sudan oil. China, on the other hand, also dominates South Sudan's oil industry with 41% shares. And this is the current percentage they are still getting. The oil extraction contractual agreements were inherited from Sudan in 2011. And the companies under those agreements, mainly the People's Republic of China companies, continue to operate after the two countries separated. The government of South Sudan by then was new. So it continued with the oil production based on the terms and conditions that were available at the time with the hope to make things right sooner. So the renegotiation was not done immediately. Oil extraction without proper policies. Yes, as I mentioned earlier, because the government did not have time to renegotiate, to set policies, they needed money to operate. Since 2011, there has been no proper plans put in place for protecting, strong managing the environment. Not even by the CNPC, that is the Chinese national uh, companies, who are long friends. This is how we refer to them here. <laughs> friends of South Sudan in the oil operation. A baseline assessment was not conducted. No not before, not even commencing, after commencing the production. A comprehensive environmental audit has never been conducted. This is important because if you are to conduct any oil extraction, you have to do an environmental audit. For you to take care of the population, for you to know even the type of the soil, the type of the land that you will be operating in, for you to know the consequences of the production. And so CNC, CNPC companies find it advantageous. It is not that they do not know it is important to do all the above that I mentioned, but they took advantage to continue extracting the oil because it was cheaper to do that. Therefore, the lessons we have learned here is that if there is no quick turn around in terms of waste management, handling of the cases of children born with the deformities, because in my article, I also mentioned that there are 218 children reported uh, to have been born with deformities from Upper Nile and Unity region. Animals have been dying also as the consequences of drinking water contaminated. People have been displaced and suffering from unknown diseases. So then the whole, of, the whole idea of producing oil for development is challenged by reality of 
oil becoming more of a curse than a blessing. So the plan should be that instead of continuing with the oil production in a wrong way, the government should turn around together with the oil companies and accept to actually do environmental audit, do an assessment, do better management so that things can be done correctly the way they are supposed to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And I encourage those interested to uh, download the paper because she explores the points that she made in greater detail. And I know we're going to do that in the discussion as well. I wanna turn now to Agnes, um, who will be presenting on distant water fishing. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Good uh, morning to you this afternoon or evening on our side. So um, I will go uh, directly into the subject. Uh, first, I will, I'm not sure everybody knows what distance, distant water fishing is, uh, but distant water fishing basically is um, uh, the, the idea of uh, uh, fishing nations, rich fishing nations uh, with greater technology and greater uh, resources uh, traveling to distant places to, uh, to, to fish, to exploit uh, marine resources and especially fisheries. Uh, so the decent water fishing happens because uh, of market needs, to satisfy market needs, but also uh, to satisfy consumptions um, for, for large uh, countries. Um, mostly in Asia, but also in uh, America, in the Americas, and in Europe. Uh, now, uh, in numbers, uh, distant water fishing uh, fleets are, there aren't many uh, uh, fleets around the world. There are only about 10 uh, distant water fishing fleets that uh, cover 90% of the distant water fishing uh, around the world. And uh, among them, uh, China increasingly has been uh, growing to dominate in the sector. And uh, today uh, we have uh, not very clear statistics, but basically China um, has between, at least the, the, the figures that are available are between uh, 3,000 and 6,000 uh, vessels that are uh, Chinese around the world. Uh, and uh, in comparison, the closest competitor to this fleet is the European Union's fleet with uh, its 27 members, which, has about, which had at least as of 2018, 250 uh, fleets globally. So, um, other decent water fishing fle uh, nations are Japan, um, France, Spain, uh, Russia, uh, South Korea mostly. And, um, uh, but uh, as I say, China largely dominates in that. Now, uh, the Gulf of Guinea, um, why, well, I, why I looked at the Gulf of Guinea is because I live in the Gulf of Guinea and I'm from the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, the Gulf of Guinea is also uh, an interesting region uh, because it has a lot of uh, very abundant fishing resources and marine resources in general. Um, uh, and distant water fishing nations uh, tend to have depleting stocks in their regions, uh, so need to come to richer um, waters. Now, uh, the, the Gulf of Guinea is uh, uh, is a, uh, well, it's a, not a region as such, but it's uh, an area of two regions, West and Central Africa. It covers uh, 19 countries, 19 coastal countries, and uh, six landlocked countries. Um, it has uh, uh, over 6,000 kilometers of coastal of coastlines and a population of uh, probably about half a billion now. And um, a very young population with a median age of uh, about 18 years. Now, uh, China, 
its relation to the Gulf of Guinea um, is uh, basically long long term uh, relations, which for some countries are mostly bilateral before uh, the more recent engagement with uh, the African Union as a, as a, a unit. It uh, it has bilateral uh, relations with a lot of countries, uh, some dating back over 50 or 60 years ago. Now, um, what is the problem with distant water fishing in the Gulf of Guinea? Uh, basically, uh, distant water fishing is, is, a, is a legal activity, uh, but it, and it's, uh, it's, it's done through mostly agreements between countries. But, um, but the problem is, uh, is the imbalance that uh, is increasingly created between uh, the distant fishing, the distant water fishing nations and the host countries. Uh, mostly there's opacity in the agreements. There's uh, increasingly dangerous and illegal practices and uh, environmentally damaging uh, practices uh, which are usually prohibited in terms of the ways the fishing is, is done. And uh, the other main problem, uh, which is the most publicized, is the subsidies, uh, mostly of uh, fuel that uh, distant water fishing provide for their countries. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the consequences for the uh, host countries and the small countries in the Gulf of Guinea are mostly um, uh, the fact that, uh, well, first they cannot compete. The um, artisanal fishing is the main uh, type of fishing to have fresh fish in this region. Uh, most countries rely on uh, exports of frozen and usually poor quality fish. Uh, and the alternative is the fresh fish that is uh, caught by, this, by small scale uh, fishers or artisanal fishers. And those cannot compete uh, obviously with uh, the distant water fishing nations, especially China, because China um, is the dominant nation uh, in the region. And um, um, increasingly uh, vessels, especially Chinese vessels, uh, fish not only in the EZ, which is the uh, allocated area for, for their activities, but also uh, closer to the shore in the ter and to territorial waters, which is normally reserved for artisanal fishers. Um, so the, the, now the fish, where does the fish go? Uh, basically the fish uh, caught by distant water fishing, um, as I said, uh, does not benefit local consumers because it's uh, usually uh, exported directly from the sea to the uh, global markets and never reaches local markets um, and uh, and that's really where uh, the, the the difficulties uh, begin but it's also where perhaps there's uh, an opportunity for uh, local uh, actors uh, because the distant water fishing affects their livelihoods. Uh, and when livelihoods are affected, we probably have a better opportunity to engage people. Um, there's also a fast depletion of stocks, which means everybody is losing. And some of these uh, stocks that are depleted may never be replaced um, because of the, the, the practices, but also because of climate uh, change and acidification of the oceans. Um, so what, uh, what we need to, to look into is how to improve, uh, first of all, the interest in the maritime domain uh, from, from the countries of the Gulf of Guinea. But also, um, there is very little investment, uh, if any at all, on um, on, uh, on on the fishing sector in uh, in most countries of the Gulf of Guinea, uh, and uh, and then there's the weak judiciaries, um, because corruption is a, it plays a very important part in the practices that I'm, the illegal practices that I mentioned. Uh, most of the 
practices are related to economic crimes uh, like corruption, fraud, uh, bribery of uh, public officials, and uh, uh, even money laundering um, from uh, large conglomerates. Um, now, um, so yeah, so I think that uh, civil society uh, at the moment uh, is not very much on board because of lack of knowledge or interest in the issues because we should also keep in mind that most of the countries, the coastal countries in the Gulf of Guinea are oil producing countries uh, and have been oil dependent for the majority of them so far. And um, it would take a, a change uh, in and diversification of economies for uh, countries to be uh, take to be in, in more involved in looking at other resources like marine resources. Um, so yeah, I think that's um, what I can I can say. And I also just have to add that the the main opportunity we have now is that there's a, a big global um, uh, call for the end to. Uh, IU fishing, illegal, uh, unreported and unregulated fishing, as you said, Glenn. Um, and I think that because it's a, it's a global issue that affects everybody, uh, it probably it, would, it might be easier to take civil society actors on board as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. Um, Jen Dai. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Glenn, and uh, both Mary and Agnes. I really enjoyed your papers, your excellent papers, and um, I'm very happy to serve as a discussant uh, for them. You know, the issues that you bring out about, uh, particularly Agnes, about China's uh, opaque type of contracting uh, and the fact that there's uh, quite a lot of corruption uh, going on between Chinese companies and African officials, as well as the issues of how the Chinese government subsidizes these companies so that they can actually have an unfair competitive advantage with uh, local or national companies, I think is themes that we heard also when we looked at uh, Mauritius's safe city project and the construction sector in Zambia. So this seems to be a characterization of China's approach towards um, African contracting. It's probably global, but it's certainly a characterization of you know, being opaque, having these confidentiality clauses, making sure that these contracts don't see the light of day and are um, effectively corrupting of local officials because they are no longer accountable to their citizens. They're not willing to actually make these contracts public I think is a characterization of its sharp power um, approach. But what I found extremely um, enlightening uh, in both of your papers was the impact of these practices on local communities, uh, particularly the extractive industry and how in the Gulf of Guinea countries, uh, it's leading to the depletion of the fishes, um, but also the protein of the population itself, basically the health of the population. So where there is local fishing, um, people aren't getting fresh fish yet. They're getting you know, lower quality frozen goods imported into the country. So putting multiple costs um, on society. Um, and in the case, uh, Mary, of yours, these, uh, you know, the wastewater coming off of this extraction uh, and oil production is getting into the land, it's getting into the water, it's leading to significant, as you said, unknown diseases, still birds, miscarriages, de deformities, infertility, the tremendous impact um, that's being had on the population. I think goes beyond even um, the impact that we see where in the construction, where there's something left over, at least you think, you know, it's bad because it's corrupting. And, you know, the question is over the long term, um, it's unsustainable. But in this case, it's an immediate impact on the health of the population. And so I guess I, I would ask, um, I'll, I'll ask you both two questions. Um, Mary, for you, as you mentioned, South Sudan. Um, inherited 
these contracts um, upon its independence. But yet they put in place new legislation, the South Sudan Petroleum Act of 2012, which is supposed to actually lead to the type of environmental and social impact audits and assessments that you mentioned. They are putting in place the unified uh, human resource uh, policy manual, which is supposed to create fair practices uh, between uh, staff coming from South Sudan and that in China. How far has the government got in implementing these new policies and these new approaches? Did they just pick it up internationally and put it in their legislation without any real engagement with civil society, without, you know, is it just a cut and paste job? Or is there something real behind this legislation? Is there something that civil society can hold on to to try to force more accountability um, in their government? So that's one question is, can the legislation give leverage to civil society? Can it also help the government in its power asymmetry with Chinese companies that are unfairly subsidized by you know, the, the government? Um, and therefore in a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis society and the government. And then, you know, is civil society, does it have any way to hold on to this? And then the second question I have, Mary, is you didn't mention in your paper the issue at all of corrupt government officials in South Sudan, you know, who are partnering with these Chinese companies so that they can look the other way and not actually have to do the audits, um, not have to do the assessments on the environment. What role does that play um, in, in accountability of South Su Sudanese officials to stop these types of harmful um, environmental practices? And Agnes, I guess I'd ask you the question of, you know, you, you really point out, I think very well, um, how government officials are uh, culpable, you know, national and regional government officials are culpable in um, trying to stop uh, China's uh, distant water fishing, uh, IUU practices, illegal, unreported and unregulated uh, practices. I, I thought it was noteworthy. I, I learned that China is the worst out of 152 coastal states on the global IUU index. And as you said, it's entirely dominant within this sector, but yet it's the worst offender. Um, so I guess my question to you is, given that, as you point out in your paper, many of these Gulf of Guinea countries are having maritime boundary disputes with themselves. Um, the fact that civil society now is across multiple countries, not just in, within one country, what type of, uh, how would you push in terms of recommendations for the governments of the region and the citizens of those nations to get greater uh, capacity to hold China accountable? You, you also mentioned that this is a sustainability issue that affects all of us globally. How can they leverage international best practice? You know, you mentioned that the uh, United States and the G7, or basically the G7 countries should see this as an opportunity to invest, particularly in artisanal fishers, uh, fishermen, right? Or fisherwomen, <laughs> you know, uh, fisher people. Uh, is that realistic? Is that a real investment opportunity? You said that there's a greater demand for investment um, in that area, but would that actually serve as a counterbalance to the dominance that you see of China's fleet um, and distance water fishing? So I, I will stop with those two questions and uh, look forward to our discussion uh, beyond them as well. Thank you very much, Jen Dai. I want to encourage the audience also to pose questions using the Q&A function at the uh, bottom of your screen, because we'll have some time at the end of the session to take questions from the audience. But um, let me turn over to uh, Mary and then Agnes to engage uh, Jen Dai's questions. Thank you, Jen Dai and uh, Glenn. Indeed, there are legal frameworks in South Sudan that were enacted starting from 2012 especially the Petroleum Act. 2012, then immediately 2013, when the government was trying to now see how they will reform 
things didn't work out well because the conflict came in. And given the fact that we were talking about opaque contracts that people don't know, they are not even publicly gazetted for everyone to read. It is only the few politicians who negotiated the agreements, actually who negotiated the contracts with the Chinese. They are the ones who knows what is in those contracts. And because of the corruption practices that you mentioned, they never wanted it to be open. So what happened, we now have the initiatives to reform, but nobody knows what is inside that contract, especially in public and the civil society. So when it comes to the legal framework, South Sudan did not only copy because all these uh, frameworks, like the Petroleum Act was taken all the way to parliament, uh, the civil society also had contribution into it. The media did the, the, the public sensitization on the Petroleum Act. So the problem is not the, the policies that are in place. The question is implementation of those policies. And that is where the problem has been. Let me give for example, in 2020 December, the Council of Ministers issued an order that the unified human resource policy should be implemented. Do you know what happened? The order went out and all the companies kept silent. They never responded. They did not do anything about it. Instead, they are lobbying underground that South Sudan should actually scrap such policies which question how the oil companies are operating. And so it is becoming like a diplomatic issue rather than a business issue. Because if people start thinking about diplomacy in terms of the oil sector engagement, problem arise. And that is why words like, we are your friends. Why would you want to question us for not doing ABCD? Give us time and all those things. So that is the problem we have on the political uh, side in terms of the implementation of those policies. So the policies are really good. When it comes to what the civil society is doing, before the civil society wasn't that much engaged in terms of following up and holding the government into account. Even awareness on these policies like the Petroleum Act if you go to those areas I have mentioned in Unity State and in Upper Nile, people don't know why some of these companies are even operating there to do what? They only see by their eyes that there is oil extraction that is taking place. In fact, what they feel is only the impact, but any other social benefits, they don't get them. So on the side of the civil society, the civil society was supposed to help the communities in doing their awareness. And as you can see in my paper from 2020, 2021, at least the civil society has now started engaging with the government. And last year, they really did a lot of uh, greater job during the, uh, the extractive industry and transparency initiative conference. The civil society members came out and they clearly call on the government to be serious on the implementation of the Petroleum Act and actually to conduct a comprehensive environmental audit before any extraction in other locations is done. The impact is also seen that those lands actually in few years to come may not be inhabitables anymore. People will not stay there because you cannot cultivate in such a land. If you see now the environment, the temperatures are already rising because of the pollution. And on the last area, uh, which you, you mentioned, I would like to also say that the, the area of the corrupt government official it is because here in South Sudan, all these contracts were negotiated by the politician. We don't have experts that actually go and negotiate on behalf of the government. 
It is the same government officials who negotiate. Tomorrow, when a problem is that, they now even fear to question what they sign. Because how do you question what you sign up for? What you actually negotiated and agreed on? So because of that confidentiality, every other thing to the politicians is not known to them. Some of them never knew that even there will be resistance one day to environmental audits or other policies that the country will come out of. So in simplicity, the issue of the corrupt government officials, we now see that even the 2%. One day I asked uh, some people from Unity State whether they know, especially in Melut area, whether they know if they are to get 2%. They said they don't know because it is only the top government officials who know that there is 2% money that is allocated to that specific area and it is supposed to go to them. So what do they do? They sign up for that 2% and they keep it. It now belongs to those few individuals. So the, this issue of the corrupt government official, the issue of transparency and accountability has been a problem in our history. Since 2011 up to now, there is no accountability, there is no transparency. And on the areas of the media and civil society to help in holding uh, the government officials accountable, they don't even know the terms and conditions in the contract. So you will hear that the 2% got lost. You will only look at how. But the origin of what they sign is never known to, to, to us. So uh, lastly, I would say that the, the revitalized agreement for the resolution of conflict in South Sudan actually provided in Chapter 4 economic reforms. And the current um, uh, Ministry of Petroleum, specifically the minister, was trying to help in making sure that the policies are implemented. But do you know what? They, there is a resistance because the people who signed before are influencing the oil companies that don't, because the moment they start implementing the policies, they will lose everything that they sign up for. So uh, Chinese on our side, in terms of the oil uh, sector, they are harboring corruption. Because if they are not harboring corruption, they will actually accept to follow the right procedures. Now that South Sudanese government and the people know what they want and that they want to change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Agnes, over to you. OK, thank you. Um... Well, I will um, take on something that Mary said uh, about uh, uh, diplomacy. Um, I think that we, we really have to keep in mind that a lot of uh, our countries are also big uh, economic partners of China uh, and other countries, but um, that also plays uh, uh, an important role in China's capacity to get away with a lot of uh, the things and the practices that uh, they, 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 they undertake. So, um, um, Jendai, well, you know, um, so on your second question, um, is uh, investment possible and uh, is it, well uh, fisheries I think we, we the problem in this region that we've had in a long time you know uh, this is not a new problem it's uh, it's a problem that has been around for decades um, maybe it wasn't necessarily done by China uh, alone and it's still not done by China alone um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, a practice by by different other countries. Just that China's uh, because of its size um, is now overwhelming, and also because the practices that we see uh, from other countries, at least from the European Union, for instance, uh, the contracts, even if they're not uh, fully transparent. Uh, at least we know they exist. The problem with uh, China is that we have a lot of uh, vessels in the region's waters and we don't know uh, how they are there, why they are there, and uh, whether they are there illegally or uh, through any kind of agreement. And 
uh, really government doesn't want to share information, especially uh, when it comes to China, because China also uh, doesn't necessarily have the same uh, standards in terms of transparency and accountability that uh, European or other countries may have. Uh, but having said that, uh, I would say to you, is it worth it or is it going to work? Well, it, fisheries are a resource just like oil. Um, and I think that probably the reason why there is so much um, illegality going on is because we precisely have forgotten uh, that aspect of resources. If Chinese uh, vessels are in the, in the region, uh, it's because there's resource to be uh, extracted and because those resources have uh, financial value. Uh, so I would say the, the G7 countries uh, and the US and everyone, all the others should uh, invest because it's worth the investment. Um, but also because really, um, as I said, or oh, yeah, I, I mentioned in the paper, um, this uh, uh, sector is really um, um, important for for you know the the at the moment what we have is, is is an important sector for the people of this region uh the the we tend to you know the the investment from g7 countries and others tend to be uh what they perceive to be the needs of the countries concerned uh even though it's not necessarily what the countries want or need and uh, and at the moment, the the focus or the race for uh, dominating or beating China in infrastructure um, may not be, you know, the 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 best thing, and may probably not be what uh, countries in this region need, um, uh, uh, as opposed to probably uh, well something as uh, important as fisheries which affects uh, people's health and people's livelihoods uh, like you said it, when whether china or g7 countries come to build roads and other types of infrastructure generally it doesn't create jobs for for local people uh, the fishery sector probably would create a lot of uh, employment and would address a lot of things. The United States uh, at the moment in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, you may have noticed that I didn't make a lot of reference to it because it's in terms of fisheries, uh, it's not very visible. Uh, the US focuses on security, um, which is probably tied to oil uh, also. Uh, and, um, and uh, but uh, as I said uh, in the paper, I think at least those other countries that are, have more democratic practices uh, may have a better chance of uh, competing <laughs> with China um, in, in the, this sector because uh, they would have more uh, democratic uh, practices and transparent practices and really small scale fishers do complain a lot about Chinese uh, practices at the moment. So, you know, um, if you, if you're, you want to compete on uh, build back better, I think that's what it's, uh, uh, um, it's called, uh, then, you know, I mean, engage countries in what matters to them rather than where you think that uh, China is uh, is doing better or or uh, is doing more because we don't necessarily need more. We need quality investment, and uh, uh, at the moment, I think we don't have a lot of that uh, in the region. And uh, then, so to come to your second point on oh, well, the first one uh, on civil society. Um, it's very difficult because, again, civil society has been um, not very focused on, on these issues. Uh, it's a regional, well, IU fishing is a regional issue, 
Um, but at the moment, countries are addressing these issues as on an individual basis and regional uh, mechanisms like the ECOWAS or the ECAS uh, are not also necessarily focused on that. Uh, again, in terms of maritime issues, we are focusing on, uh, on security uh, because, well, at least the feeling here is that it's because that's uh, where the funding goes from, from uh, third uh, party countries like uh, the G7 countries or the, the European Union. Um, so um, there's little knowledge, uh, to be honest, on, on fisheries issues. Um, and uh, uh, in some, some countries are doing slightly better. If you go a bit upper in, the, in West Africa, uh, countries like Senegal or um, probably Mauritania, Gambia, um, and Ghana, Sierra Leone are the countries that would have uh, a, a sense of uh, civil society activism from mostly from fishing uh, organizations or fishers organizations. Uh, in Central Africa, there is absolutely no, no, no dynamism in that sector. Uh, but it's, uh, again, I would say it's uh, down to the level of knowledge and it's a, it's a very, it can be very technical uh, sector, um, and uh, I think that we 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 lack um, a, a, a lot of knowledge. Um, but uh, I would say the 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 opportunity here again is that we even though we lack the technical uh, knowledge in terms of the fishing sector per se, uh, there's a great deal of. Uh, activism for many years now on uh, transparency and accountability, uh, access to information and open contracting. And we have focused a lot the, of the open contracting issues on oil, uh, but uh, we can equally uh, look into uh, the transparency of uh, fishing agreements uh in uh, in in the region but also corruption because as i said the most of the the uh the the issues around fisheries are economic crimes along the fish fishing value chain and uh so far we don't have a lot of uh, uh focus on that but we do have expertise i believe in in addressing corruption and uh, all those uh, issue, issues and economic crimes. Uh, we just need to link them with uh, the fisheries sector. Thank you very much, Agnes. Before turning over to the audience, I want to give my uh, co-chair, Larry Diamond, an opportunity to pose a question. Well, thank you uh, both very much for these great talks and papers. And we have a number of good questions in the queue. You know, one of the at least partial successes of the extractive uh, uh, industries transparency initiative is it had some very simple, clear, um, direct, uh, and easy to remember uh, demands, uh, publish what you pay, publish the contracts. And um, there was a, a messaging campaign and a media campaign uh, around that. One of the challenges that you each face, um, in contrast in particular to Mauritius last week, but also again now Zambia, which I think has returned to the ranks of democracies, is that neither of your governments uh, is really uh, democratic. Uh, and I think you would agree, Agnes, you face a particular problem in Cameroon that way. So transparency um, is kind of a, you know, a broader threat uh, to the system of governance. Um, so I'm just wondering if I can push you a little further, what could be done in terms of a public messaging campaign, in terms of, um, you know, maybe uh, coordinated efforts among the diplomatic partners and the civil society 
uh, both to uh, educate your societies about the issues and press forward on some very, very simple and actionable initiatives. I can give you a simple uh, response to say funding. Um, there's there's no funding really in in this uh, on research. Uh, there's uh, there's a few there are a few research initiatives uh, in the region, uh, but not not enough, especially in Central Africa. Um, I mean, there's a lot of research on IU fishing generally. Uh, I mean, I think all the problems have been identified, uh, most of them. Um, uh, IU fishing, as we have already said, is a, a global uh, issue that everyone wants to uh, address now. And I think even uh, in terms of the subsidies that I was talking about, the, the WTO is uh, uh, doing a lot of negotiations around that at the moment. But um, that said, again, at the very local level, uh, really, I mean, even fishers themselves, when you speak with fishers, they have no clue, you know, they, they don't know where to start, where to go. Um, and they feel just very, very powerless because China is so overwhelmingly uh, big and, uh, and connected to government. So um, I, again, I really think that we can take from where we already are in terms of fighting, uh, I mean, addressing corruption. There's a lot of advocacy in these areas. Um, and uh, what we need is really to um, give people or organizations uh, already working on these issues capacity to understand how corruption works in the fisheries sector and uh, how a lot of the economic crimes work in, in the fishery sector. And I think that would be a, a useful start. Mary, did you want to address Larry's question as well? Yes, because on the side of South Sudan, uh, the country is yet to join the Extractive Industry Initiative, uh, Transparent, Transparency Initiative. The process is ongoing. It started last year. But then now, if we cannot implement simple policies on environmental audit, how do we qualify? So still, we have not established at least simple requirements on the ground that we can use for the application. This is why now the government is trying to push so hard to ensure that there is an environmental audit done there can be an assessment so that they have something to attach to the application. So the application is open, they are interested, but they don't even have a single, a single paper to attach so that at least they have something to qualify them. So these are the areas whereby the civil society really comes in to raise that consciousness and also to help push the government to ensure that the environmental audit issues, the issues of human resources, uh, policy implementation are done. That way, then we can move to that stage of uh, doing. Thank you. I want to turn to the audience questions now, and I'm going to group them together to make sure that we have an opportunity to address them uh, in the limited time available. Um, a couple of them have to deal with um, China's role uh, in uh, supporting the authoritarian tendencies or undemocratic tendencies of governments in the region. And I know that, um, for example, China is the largest contributor to the peacekeeping mission in South Sudan, and that's largely uh, largely because it has oil investments in the country and it wants to preserve them. But to what extent does that give China leverage over the government of South Sudan broadly? Uh, and uh, and uh, limit the capacity of civil society to really hold its own uh, government democratically accountable. And I would ask a similar question in, in the Gulf of Guinea region as well, but particularly with respect to Cameroon, um, the role that China more broadly plays in the struggle for democratization and accountability locally. Um, and so just briefly, both of you, please. So in this area, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the issue, the diplomatic issues. So South Sudan has said it's still a new country. As I mentioned earlier, 
they need friends to support them. They, they, they want people who can be there for them. And in our case also, we have problem that the oil sector is not only completely owned by South Sudan because the production is done in South Sudan, but the pipeline through, uh, passed through Sudan. So we still have issues that were not resolved from Sudan. So China, on the other hand, got, have good relationship with Sudan. They have their own agreements that they made. They had their own conditions. So in this uh, area now, when the government look into opportunities to change what was not done well before, it end up involving two more countries. That is Sudan and China. And given the political situation in both countries now, it is difficult for them to sit down and talk about the areas of sustainability, which is like oil. How do we change what we did not do well? Again, it is the same political elites who negotiated these contracts. They are the ones who are still currently in power. So what China has already told them that there are agreements, maybe they have done underground, which we don't know. It is the reason why it is very hard to implement those policies because those people still want to maintain what they had agreed on. Meanwhile, if we have new people in the system, like the current Minister of Petroleum, is actually seen now as if he is an enemy to the Chinese companies that is targeting them. Because he just came in as a new person, he doesn't know what has been done before, he just saw that there are things that are not right, that he want to put right. But people start leveling him as an enemy only to the Chinese sector. This has become a lesson that there are still already people in the system who feel that nothing should be changed while they are still around. And I think this is where the area of changing things become questionable. How do you change things when those who did it wrong are still around? And this is where the civil society need to dig deeper and ensure that we look for strategies, ways of making, even if you are still there, you have to be held accountable. So I would finally say, yes, like uh, South Sudan, because the country is new, we have now policies and people are excited to change things. There are a lot of chances for us to change. But the people who did the things wrong are still there. So it's about now the question of what do we do with those who have been there and they actually did things wrong. They are the ones who also don't want to pressure the Chinese uh, companies. Since 2020 up to now, just a simple human resource policy manual, which the whole government has agreed into it, that it is important for South Sudanese to be employed Thank and you. given similar payments. But that is not being done simply because if it is not being done and the Chinese oil companies are still in South Sudan, we don't see any order telling them that if you don't implement this policy, please quit the country. Nothing like that is coming out. That means there is a protection type somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Agnes, I wonder if we could pivot to another question that's in, coming from the audience, and that is the role that the international community can play in helping nations in the Gulf of Guinea uh, respond to the problem of distant water fishing or other natural resource extraction issues, partly in terms of helping countries develop local expertise and training, whether it be in law or in fisheries management, for example. Uh, is there funding available? Can the, can the EU, the G7, the US play a role in developing local capacity? And then secondly, um, uh, I know that the U.S. Coast Guard, for example, is partnering with nations in the Pacific to help enforce um, their own local regulations against uh, IUU, uh, because we have resources where we can sign agreements with local governments to help them police their waters. Is there a role for the G7, for the French, for the British, for e, you know, Spanish forces, for other partners of Cameroon, Nigeria, and others, to help local police forces and local navies enforce their own regulations. 
Um, yeah, well, um, I mean, the, as I said, at the moment, uh, the main interest from, and well, the EU is, uh, I think, is the main actor who is uh, uh, funding, at least in terms of direct uh, financial funding, uh, is active in, in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, but the EU uh, tends to focus on um, since 2013, when the, the you know piracy and armed robbery uh, at sea became the main issues in the region, or at least were portrayed to be the main issues. Uh, that's where the focus uh, has been, both for um, international actors and for governments. Uh, for on the part of governments, I think it's really it's been an opportunistic um, uh, response to to the to the issues because increasingly, uh, and I think that's also where we do have uh, an opportunity now. Uh, increasingly, everybody is uh, acknowledging that the focus on piracy may not have been the. the uh, the priority, uh, the, well, the, the right priority, um, because uh, other issues are still more prevalent, uh, and IU is one of them. So um, I would say, I think the the, the shift, uh, and well, also I have to um, just disclose that I'm working at the moment on an EU-funded program, uh, and from which. Uh, was uh, I think the EU had a five-year uh, strategy, which is ending, which ended uh, last year, uh, and they're now developing a new strategy, which probably from lessons learned will include um, more of those other issues. Uh, the US, on the other hand, uh, mostly has been providing technical assistance or an expertise. Uh, through military exercises and um, and uh, and vessels, uh, I mean, um, from uh, the navy and all that. But what I would say is really that maybe uh, that that is good for government, but it's not necessarily good for uh, for these kind of issues because it doesn't affect uh, people. When you have uh, vessels patrolling uh, the, the high seas, um, you know it's not it's it's not going to do much for the small scale fisher uh, who is concerned about China um, getting into its uh, area of fishing. It doesn't affect that small scale fisher uh, in terms of his capacity to spend more time at sea. Uh, and also the, really the, the environmental aspect is, is getting critical because uh, fishers uh, are, have to go increasingly further at sea uh, to, find, to find fish. So that means uh, the issue is not just that, you know, um, China is uh, going beyond where it's supposed to go, it's also just that. Uh, we are we are fishing beyond uh, our capacity, which includes um, local fishers. By the way, they you know they, I mean in uh, in in the Congo, uh, in the Republic of Congo, it's very very um, uh, current to see uh, sharks being fished by traditional fishers being caught, and um, there's a, there's a market where they sell these. Uh, uh, fish and they, they, there's some form of surveillance, but what they get is uh, 2,000 CEFA um, fines, which is uh, for per fish, which is uh, about uh, uh, $4, I think. Um, so I think in terms of training, well, first we need to really uh, address the legal uh, framework and uh, uh, because we also have a, a, a lot of uh, uh, gaps in the legislations in of the different countries where I, all these crimes are not uh, are not crimes per, by uh, as per the laws of the countries um, they are they are administrative uh, uh, infringement and uh, so we need to really uh, address that and uh, better organize the legal 
framework and then also address the 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 criminal aspect of these uh, uh, issues thank you very much Agnes um, you know I think both of your papers make very clear that in in the discussions about this what's often forgotten but what must be put at the fore are really real people's livelihoods and how these economic activities measured in GDP or geopolitical considerations often lose sight of how uh, individual people's lives are affected by the decisions made at a higher level. And both of your papers really bring that out in rich detail. Um, this is ultimately about civil society, democracy, transparency, and, and real people have stakes in that. Thank you very much for participating in our program, for authoring such fabulous papers, which again are downloadable from hoover.org slash CGSP. Thank you, Jen Dye, for your wonderful comments in support of our program. And we will continue to partner with our friends in Africa to help solve these questions and explore them more deeply. Uh, on January 31st, I want to alert you, um, we have an event coming up. Uh, that is going to be a, a quite uh, interesting event, I think, for all of you. It's entitled the uh, China on the Eve of the Winter Olympics, Hard Choices for the World's Democracies. We're going to be joined by George Soros, uh, who will be followed by a panel discussion about the challenges the world's democracies face in their relations with more assertive China. Uh, the panel consists of US, former U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor Matt Pottinger and Oriana Schuyler Mastro, Center Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Center for Inst Institute for International Studies here at Stanford. I hope you'll join us for that. Thank you very much. <laughs>